do like Nick in the service and do a solo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's recording. All right, well, good. Welcome to the class this morning. It's good to see everybody, and I tell you what, I am so excited to be back in here meeting with everybody to be able to teach class. But uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Bob, would you lead us, please, in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for a wonderful day you've given us to just gather with uh, fellow believers here in this place and to worship you, to praise you, and to glorify you, and Lord, we're just uh, so thankful that we can be back together, and we do ask that you, you just keep your loving arms around us, keep your arms around those that just need to feel your presence, need to feel your healing upon them, and uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, Mike, his willingness to, to come and share this morning with us, it's time of preparation, and we just ask that you would bless it, and uh, Lord, just uh, just give us what we need to, to be better prepared to go out into that world and to share that good news with others and to be your light, your shining example in this world that needs to, to see your light. And um, Lord, we just pray now today that we'll bring honor and glory to you. It's everything that's done and everything that's done and everything that's said here today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. All right. Sorry about not having the quarterlies. I think they've all gotten dispersed out. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, it's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 37. And we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. It's verses 14 to 20, and then verses 30 to 35. So if you'll allow me, I'll read the printed text. Then we'll come back and look at it and talk about it and see what God has to say to us. So starting with Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which have sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And this shall be a sign unto thee. You shall eat this year, such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward, and bear fruit upward for out of jerusalem shall go forth a remnant and they that escape out of mount zion the zeal of the lord of hosts shall do this therefore thus saith the lord concerning the king of assyria he shall not come into this city nor shoot an arrow there nor come before it with shields nor cast a bank against it by the way that he came by the same shall he return and shall not come unto this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. All right, so what we have going on, if you've been keeping up, is the Assyrians have already decimated the northern kingdom. And now, uh, basically, the... Uh, Ahaz had kind of made an alliance with the Assyrians to kind of help protect them, and then things went bad, and and now, you know, Hezekiah is king, and the Assyrians are now going to make a run towards uh, the Judah, and, and they are making words, and the, the king of, you know, the Assyrians is Sennacherib, and he's basically going to come back, and he's going to come in, and he's making all these threats, what he's going to do, and and, and just 
really just saying your God can't protect you and he's sending all of these different words to him and he's got a messenger that's his kind of liaison that comes up and says things. And basically, Hezekiah goes and finds Isaiah and says, we need some help. So there's a big difference between what Ahaz did and what Hezekiah did. Ahaz didn't think God could take care of him. So he started searching out, trying to build alliances to let man help him. Whereas Hezekiah sought out the prophet to go to God first. That's the lesson that we need to learn. That when we get into trouble, instead of looking for man to bail us out or help us, is to go to God. God is standing there ready. And this scripture is just a great scripture to show us what God's going to do. So, as uh, Sennacherib has been sending all of these threats and taunts and everything else, they get a letter. And this is where we take off in verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. So basically what Hezekiah did is after he got this letter, instead of panicking and trying to figure out who can he align with and everything else, now there were some things that were going on. But first thing he did is he went up before God and in a posture of prayer and petition, he opened up and he had the letter spread before God saying, God, here's what this man is saying against you. Now, the point that we've got to remember very, very clearly is that in his heart, he did not want God's name besmirched. That was primary importance to him is to protect the name of God. And I believe even if they were to be destroyed, he still wanted God to be intact in his power and who he was. And that's what he wanted more than anything else is for God's name to stand strong in all the nations to see what was going on. So as he goes up before God and gets in a, pair, a position of prayer and petition, seeking God's help, saying, here's what's going on, God, which God knows what's going on. But sometimes God likes it when we come before him and try to explain how it's affecting us. And that's what's going on because it shows Hezekiah's heart. So in verse 15, Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, and here's what he said. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. All right, let's stop right there just a minute. He addressed God as Lord of hosts, Lord of everything. Now, this is kind of a bit ironic. Here, he's acknowledging that God is in complete control when the Assyrians are basically right outside of his door, ready to come in and decimate him. How many battles have the Assyrians lost? None. Nobody has been able to withstand the onslaught of the Assyrians. They were brutal. They were horrible. They were just, they were the original terrorists. How many of you guys have read or are reading or plan to read Harbinger 2? I've started it. I read Harbinger 1. Oh my goodness, Harbinger 2 is going to open your eyes up. But Jonathan Kahn talks about the Assyrians as the original terrorists. And uh, I can see this. And there is, I don't want to tell it, but it, it'll blow you away of what God's saying to us and what he's pointing to us and what's going on and what happened on 9-11. And it's just, folks, you need to read this because God's coming. God's given us warnings, and I don't think we're going to heed it. <laughs> I think we're going to be just like Israel. And he breaks it all down, and it's, it's wild. But anyway, here he goes up to God, acknowledges him as the Lord of hosts, even though the Assyrians are right on his doorstep, he knows God's in control. And he says, you know, that the same God that dwelleth between the cherubims, all right, what that is is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top were the two cherubims, and then the, the mercy seat, God was right there in the middle. That's basically where God's house was or where God dwelt. And God's everywhere, but this is the picture that they had. Now, where was the uh, Ark of the Covenant? Where was it positioned? 
the Holy of Holies. And who was allowed to go in there? The only the high priest and only once in a, a year on the Day of Atonement. So this is when he went in and made the petitions for the people to try to roll back their sins for another year. But he knew this is where God was and he's, he's addressing God and saying, this is what I need. I, Hezekiah was proclaiming that he believed God is present and would hear him. Folks, that's critical. That when we go to prayer, we go to God to ask him anything, is that we believe that he is with us, that he's listening, and that he's able to do whatever we ask. Now, the Bible talks about if you pray with enough faith, you can move mountains. So, okay, I'm going to try that. Well, hold it. You're testing God. What benefit is it going to be for you to move a mountain? But let's take that mountain and make it figurative. There's a mountain in your life that you need removed. Pray to God to remove that mountain because it's something that you desperately need or that's hindering you in maybe your spiritual walk. Then see what God does. Pray and believe that God will take care of it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Okay, that's good, but you can leave out the I believe it part because if God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, that settles it. So, He's addressing God, and uh, he, he, he mentions Sennacherib's false claim that God of Israel is no different than any of the other gods of the people that the Assyrians overthrew, and they did. Everybody around in those areas had gods, and they all prayed to their gods. And I'm going to give you a little hint. Sennacherib gets his, and he's killed by one of his sons, while he was doing something. He was praying to his false god when he was killed. So I'm giving you a little preview. Down the road here, Sennacherib gets his. But here, he's still a mighty force to be reckoned with. And he's sending all these taunts to Israel, or to Judah, saying, nobody's been able to stop me. No god is powerful enough to stop me, including your god. Well, now he just ticked him off. Now you've come against my God. And to me, that is the most important thing. You have blasphemed, you have slandered, you have belittled my big, powerful God. And he's going to show you what's going to take place. So as Hezekiah makes this prayer, he said that, uh, Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach you, the living God. God knew all of this, but this is for our benefit to be able to read and see what was going on in his heart. He said, God, I want you to look at this. I want you to see what he's saying. My main focus is protecting your reputation, God. Yes, I want you to save us. I really do. That's very important to me. But more so is I want you to save your name and your reputation, and I want you to act. He did, did not argue that somehow the people of Judah deserved to be saved based on their character. Instead, Hezekiah argued that if Sennacherib won, God's own reputation would be damaged. That was what he did not want more than anything else. Judah needs to look to, uh, to took a back seat to God's glory and honor. They messed up big time. They didn't, they just not paying attention. They had time to repent. They didn't do it. God has to use certain things. But you know what? What do we know about Hezekiah? What's one of the great things that we know that he got a bad, some bad news about his health. He's going to die. He's going to die. And what did he do when he got that news? He prayed. He cried out to God. And God heard him and gave him how many more years? Fifteen more years. And everything he did for them was just excellent. He never messed up, right? No. He still was a great king, but he had a little pride problem in his nation. And there's, there's a few verses in here that are really backwards in the time frame, but it's because I think they were trying to address and settle up with the Assyrians before they jumped in with the Babylonians. 
But the Babylonians sent some messengers as they were trying to assert themselves on the scene as a, as a great power, and they're trying to build some alliances. And they come to Judah. And Hezekiah, proud of his nation, starts going around showing these messengers all of his treasures and all the great things of, of, of Judah. And they took note of it. And the Babylonians came back and just came in and uh, stole everything and just made a mess of things. But in the most, for the most part, Hezekiah had a heart towards God. Now, folks, we're all human. We all mess up. If you heard that message this morning, which was a very awesome message, uh, don't be a worldly Christian. <laughs> uh, according to Mark, he doesn't think there is such a thing. But be a committed Christian. Have people say to you, you know, I wish I could be more like you because you take a stand. We need to take a stand. Folks, next Sunday, Franklin Graham has called for prayer and fasting for our nation for this election coming up. Uh, you know, we're having the, uh, the prayer, uh, round the clock prayer here too. This is going to be probably the most important election in our lifetime. And, uh, you know, God might make it go a different direction than I'd like to see just because we're going to, he's working some things out here for punishment. But I, I'm praying, you know, God, have your way, and I pray you keep things going in a positive direction instead of in a negative direction. But you can look around at our society and you can see that we're crumbling. Mm -hmm. America is just crumbling, and I don't get it. I don't understand what the allure to socialism is. I don't see what the problem with police are. I, I, we, we're headed towards chaos, and it's sad. But let's get back to the lesson. Verses 18 through 20. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries and have cast their gods into the fire, but they were no gods really, but, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. This is his true heart. This is why he wants God to save him, to prove who God is. Remember back, he said he was the Lord of hosts. He was the God of everybody. And he wants everybody to acknowledge that. He wants everybody to turn to his God. That is what we are supposed to be doing. We should want everybody to be saved. We want God's name protected. And that's exactly what he's saying right here. <coughs> And this is still fulfilling with what we've been doing with, with his prayer. Is God, I want you to be taken care of. He came into all these other countries. They started praying to their gods. They didn't help because their gods were not really gods after all. They were false idols. They were fake gods. You, God, are the true, the one, the only real God. I want you to prove it by saving us, not so much to save us so we get by, but to prove who you are to the rest of the world. All right, verse 30 and 31. And this shall be a sign unto thee. God's getting ready to tell him something here. Now, this is going to be very, very important. And it might not make a lot of sense, but we'll come back and explain it in just a minute. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. This is what God's saying to Hezekiah when the Assyrians are at the door ready to come in and completely annihilate Judah. Now, when an evading army comes in, to another kingdom, what they will do is they want to get inside the fortification of that city, which generally has walls around it. And it's hard to come against those walls. A lot of times they're built on a high city. And here we've got Jerusalem, got walls around it. The enemy's wanting to come in. 
So basically a lot of the crops are all built outside. So they just destroy all the crops, either burn them or they'll take them and eat them themselves or whatever to try to starve them out. Starving them out can take a long time, especially if they've got a lot of stuff stored up. So another thing that they do is they will build a ramp up to the wall, up on the wall. And they build it bit by bit, stone by stone, dirt and stone, and they build it up to where they can get up and get over. Because they want to bust down the wall. They want to they want to make a breach. And the easiest place to make the breach is basically the doors, the gates. That's the easiest place to make the breach because the walls are pretty thick and high and everything else. But those the doors or the gates is the easiest place to breach. Jonathan Kahn talks about that in the Harbinger too. And it's very fresh in my mind, all the stuff he's saying, where the gate is to America. Where is the gateway to America? New York City. New York City. <laughs> anyway, so basically what he's talking about here is that they are going to destroy all of your agriculture. They've already done it. But yet God is saying here that you shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, in the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. What is it God always does when he's punishing his people or stuff's going on? He saves a remnant. <laughs> There's always a remnant. You know what? There's a remnant of food here, of seed. He said in this year, so we're talking about two and a half years here. And at the end of that time, you're going to be back into your regular cycle of reaping, harvesting, planting, and growing, and going right back to where you were. But I've preserved a remnant of seed that's going to grow up. It's going to allow you to eat this year. It's going to spring up again next year, and you're going to have food, and you're going to have enough to replant. And so then by the third year, you're back into your regular cycle. Now, this is what he's telling him with the Assyrians basically right outside the door. Now, this is the point where that five-letter word has to come into play. What is that five-letter word? Faith. Faith. You either believe God or you don't. Ahaz didn't believe him. He wanted to go get man's help. Hezekiah's taking a whole different view. I'm going to believe God. God gave him the message saying, I've got it, Hezekiah. I'm going to take care of you. How did the Assyrians get defeated? I'm jumping ahead, but what happened to them? God came in and took care of it. You know, God just came in and started uh, taking care of everything. You know, we sometimes limit the power of God. In our own lives today, we limit God's power because another, we want to jump ahead. We want to do it our way instead of God's way. We don't have the patience to wait because we're in a microwave society. We want everything now. But, you know, God wants the best for his kids. And we are God's kids. And a lot of times God wants to see what is our faith really like. Is it strong or is it weak? And when we realize what it is, then we act on that. And if it's weak, we start strengthening our, strength, our faith. Okay? You know, faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing, hearing of the word. word. Okay? So, basically, we have to hear it. We come to church. We can read it. We can play audio books of it. But we want to see what God's word is. And our faith is also strengthened by being in the battle. By God growing us. It's just like a weight lifter, a bodybuilder. They tear down their muscles. They grow back stronger. So many times we get into situations, we get tried. It's like in a fire when you're trying to get all the dross out to make the metal more pure. There's all kind of analogies. But we're in a battle as we just go through life on a daily basis. We're in a battle. Preacher referenced it. So many times people want us to acquiesce to sin, to fit in. And in our mind, sometimes we think, well, I'm going to be rejected if I don't fit in with that. I can remember sitting in Guadalajara, Mexico at a, a restaurant. They're different. They're kind of open air. 
and I was down there for one of the companies that I represented, and, and the people that owned this company basically owned that city. They, they were very well known. And uh, down in that area, uh, it's kind of like within a 50 mile radius is the, uh, the drink, um, tequila. <laughs> How'd, how'd you know that? <laughs> You're so cute, Becky. I love it. But tequila. And so they're all down there, and they've got all this tequila, and they're playing all these games and everything else. And I'm sitting beside the president of this company. And he turns around and looks at me, and he goes, why are you not drinking? I said, well, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I just made the decision I was not going to partake of alcohol. And I, at that point, he turned his back on me and never said another word to me, and I lost the line. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my buddy sitting beside of me, drinking tequila, he said, I wish I could be more like you. I said, you can, Neil. You can. You just have to decide that's what I'm going to do, no matter what the consequences. Now, I only tell you success stories in my life, okay? I don't tell you when I mess up, but I am a human. <laughs> All right. So this is the sign that's going to be to you. And then in verse 31, it says, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Just like I'm going to take care of feeding you until you get back into the cycle, the same thing is going to be with the nation. There will be a remnant that's going to be spared, and you're going to flourish again, and you're going to be what God wants you to be. All right, verse 32. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. All right, I want to talk about this, the zeal of the Lord of hosts. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7, God promised that the Messianic age would come one day and that its coming would be accomplished by the zeal of the Lord of hosts. It seems likely then that Isaiah, in speaking of the restoration of Judah after the removal of the Assyrian invaders, was also hinting at a greater restoration that would come in a future time, meaning we know who? Jesus Christ. Folks, God talks about Jesus all over the Old Testament. He's always pointing towards Jesus. Don't ever forget that. The Bible doesn't contradict itself any at all. He's always pointing towards Christ because that's going to be his ultimate plan. He had to go through this way to get to that. And Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that uh, was promised, you know, that all throughout the sacrificial worship system, they had to give the best that they had. But nothing was ever good enough until Jesus came on the world. When he came walking up and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. There's the perfect sacrifice right there. All right. So God promised that the Messianic age would come one day and that his coming would be accomplished by the zeal of the Lord of hosts. And here's the reference to it again. Now, going down to verse 33 and 35. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He shall not come into this city. He's not even going to shoot an arrow there. He's not even going to come before these shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I, God, will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. So Sennacherib is not going to even get close enough to shoot an arrow into the city. He's not going to get close enough to where arrows from inside the city come towards him, so he's not going to need his shield. He's not going to get close enough to build a ramp up to try to breach it. He's not even going to get there. He said, matter of fact, and this talks about it earlier, I'm going to put a hook in his mouth and turn him around and take him back where he came. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And over in Kings, it talks about when the angel of the Lord came into the camp. So you can read that. But Sennacherib is on a downward spiral because he has insulted 
the God of everything. And God's going to show him who's boss. Sennacherib thinks he's the man, that nobody can withstand him. He's the school bully. He's the original terrorist. He thinks nobody can stop him. God can. Do not ever limit the power of God in your life. I don't care what kind of opposition, what kind of mountain is, is against you. God can take care of it. All we have to do is trust God, go to God first. God is all powerful. These stories that we read of how God took care of his people are still relevant today. God's still taking care of his people. But folks, America has turned their back on God. How many innocent babies have we killed? America's being judged for that. It's, it's, it's sad. And I'll tell you what. This Amy Coney Barrett, praise God for her, because she is a pro-life justice. And I hope you're not against this because of the time frame and everything else. But God's working things out. Now, I don't know if it's ever going to go or how this is going to work out. But all I know is one thing, that Trump promised to put pro-life judges on this justice court. And i tell you what, the other side will not. Now that to me right there singularly tells me who I need to be voting for. Because I believe in the sanctity of life. Now I'm not, I don't want to get too political because I want people to hear the message of Jesus Christ and salvation more than being upset over something I said politically. But I can't not say something about that because that is one of the problems with America today is killing all these innocent babies. And when a country or a city cheers that they can kill a baby up to when it's born, there's something wrong. Amen. There is something wrong. God's judging that, and we need to stand up and make a stand. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this lesson. And Father, I pray right now that as we sit in this room, that whatever need might be present, that you would meet that need. That you would remove that mountain, Father, whatever it is in a life that has something hindering them, that you would remove it and take it away. Father, we acknowledge you as the one, the only true God. And we thank you that we can claim you as ours. Help us to be bold, Father, in our witness for you and in our stance for you. Go with us this week, Father. Help us to do something extraordinary for you. And we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. And amen.